we're at the Lenexa Public Market and today we're talking about patience. Can you tell me what a virtue is? No, I cannot. Can I ask you a question about patience? Patience? Yes. As in like, you're a doctor? As in, hurry up and answer my question. Can you think of a time when someone was really patient with you? Uh, my grandma used to go on walks with me and when I was like really little and I kept putting words together, trying to make up new words and she was really patient no matter how many times I said something that didn't exist. What makes you lose your patience? Let's see, people who don't use blinkers. <laughs> oh, shout out my YouTube channel, go subscribe to m Here I am, waiting patiently for the Lenexa Aquatic Center to open. Is that what that building's gonna be? Aquatic Center? It is so great to see you uh, on this amazing day, and also a welcome to all those of you watching online. Uh, we have Brennan today from Kessler Air Force Base in Mississippi. Let's give it up for Brennan. And also say to you, Brennan, thank you for your service. And also want to thank those of you who've come to the 1230 service. You've done an amazing thing in freeing up seats for people who've come to all the other services that have been just filled to the brim. And so we're just so grateful that you've done that. And we're just praying God's extra blessing on you. We've been on a journey as a church that we simply call Believe. And the idea is that um, we've been exploring these 30 big ideas found in the Bible. And the notion is that if you not only understand these gargantuan ideas in your head, but you let them sink deep into your heart and actually believe them, that they'll begin to shape and form you into the kind of person God always envisioned you becoming when he created you. Today we come to one of these big ideas. It's a virtue, and it's called patience. Patience. Bottom line is God has a vision that you would become a patient person. But I don't know if you're like me. I mean, um, th th see, see if you agree with me. I think the virtue of patience would be a lot easier to develop in our life if it weren't for other people. <laughs> Matter of fact, turn to your neighbor and say, other people try my patience. Go ahead and do this. Other people just try my patience. Other people just try my patience. They do. Not you particularly, but other people try my patience. I mean, it's true. Other people... And some of them do it unintentionally, some of them do it intentionally. They just know what buttons to push, right? Uh, take uh, little Timmy, it was, it was his fifth birthday, and he was pretty excited and filled with joy about the number of presents that he had to open. And he was particularly excited and saved for last the biggest gift, the gift from his grandmother. Wow, he exclaimed when he opened it, setting his eyes on a brand new mini drum set. Grandma, I have always wanted one of these. Later, after Timothy went to bed, Timothy's mother got together with her mother, grandma, and said, Mom, I'm really surprised that you gave Timothy a drum set for his birthday. Don't you remember how that used to drive you crazy when we played the drums when we were growing up? And the grandma smiled and says, I remember. <laughs> yes, I remember. It is payback time. Um, the, um, the Bible teaches us, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, actually in a number of places, that one of the best ways that you can love somebody else is to show them patience. Show them patience. Offer them patience for their weaknesses, for their mistakes, for their shortcomings. And when you do this, it's one thing to say to people that you love them. It's another thing to show them you love them by offering them patience. We say this often, don't we? Our actions speak louder than our words. Can I get an amen? Amen, right? Well, today also happens to be Easter Easter Sunday, it is without question, I mean, it is without question the most significant day in all of human history. Today, over 2.2 billion people will gather all over the world to celebrate this very day. And some of you get that for sure. And some of you, I'm pretty sure, some of you are like, I don't really get all the hoopla around it. And it's my prayer by the end of the service, you're going, okay, I get it. Now, if you're a golfer, last weekend was the Masters weekend where Tiger Woods, greatest comeback in sports history, was, uh, was named the champion, the victor of the Masters weekend. But I'm here to tell you the truth. The real Masters weekend is today, where Jesus Christ was the victor over death and the grave. 
And he did not receive a green jacket for his victory, but rather he received an imperishable, resurrected body that he promises to offer to everyone who believes in him in this life so that we can have eternal life with him forever and ever. Can I get an even bigger amen? Now, now, love that. Now, if you want to get a beautiful picture of what patience looks like, I invite you to look at the life of God. I, like, I invite you specifically to look at the life of Jesus when he walked the earth, particularly the days that led up to this incredible day that we experience now. Now, in the Bible, particularly the New Testament, uh, when the writers wrote the New Testament, there were two words that they used for patience in the Greek language. And I'd like to teach you about those words uh, today. The first one is a compound word in the Greek language. It is hupomone. Say hupomone. Hupomone. It's a compound word. The first word, hupo, means under, and the word mone means to remain. When you put them together, it means to remain under. And the idea is that there is a weight that you're being, in, you're being asked to carry. And so my team put together a, a backpack with actual weights in it, and I, I really wanted just like a fake weights, and I tell them I could pretend, but they put real weights in. This thing is super heavy, and it's making my jacket all wrinkled. Okay, the notion or the idea of this word for patience is that you're in a situation in your life, a trying situation where you have a burden on you, a weight to carry. And the easiest thing for you to do would be to toss this weight off of you, but one of two things has happened in this situation. Number one, you can't get out of it. It's like an illness that you can't, you can't be healed of, right? Uh, or it's a situation that while you could get out of it, it's the right thing to do to bear under the weight for the sake of other people. Do you understand that? For example, you may be a school teacher and you feel the call of God on your life to teach children in a, uh, uh, a lesser school district where the kids are at risk and where many of them don't have the parental support that they need to succeed. And you feel the call of God on your life to teach in that place. And so you do it with great joy only to discover that it has become a major burden on you. And the easiest thing for you to do was to take the burden off of your back and go to the easier school district. But because of the call of God in your life, you choose to bear up under the weight and be patient with the students that you're working with, trying to give them a chance of life. You're doing it for their sake. Does that make sense? Or maybe it's a friend, like a friend of mine, a number of years ago, he's, he owns his own company, and a number of years ago, his CFO was embezzling money from his company and cheating clients. The CFO was eventually caught and sent to prison, but all the debt was in my friend's name. The easiest thing for him to do with this burden, awful burden that was put on him, would be to toss it off and to file for bankruptcy, but he felt the call of God in his life that he should make it right and that he should pay back all of his debtors, and over a period of 10 long years, he remained under the weight of all of it for the sake of the debtors. Or maybe it's a marriage. Maybe in this particular case, um, it's your husband, and he's been diagnosed with a mental illness, which explains all of the trying situations that you've had in the years to pass. Now you have a label for it, and you recognize it's not something he chose. It's a, a burden that he's bearing. And the easiest thing for you to do is to get out from underneath the weight of this by filing for a divorce. But because you remember the covenantal vows that you made for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, you know that the right thing to do is to bear up under the weight of the pressure and to be patient for the sake of your husband. Does it make sense? This is what Jesus did for us. I want to introduce you to a passage that many of you may not have seen in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. The writer says, For the joy set before him, for the joy set, I want you to underline the word joy if you're taking notes, for the joy set before him, referring to, so about what you're, he's about ready to experience, Jesus entered into it with a tremendous sense of joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. 
Jesus was sinless. As a matter of fact, the very people that he was trying to save at that time were the very people that were actually trying and did kill him. And yet, Jesus saw what was on the other side of this trying situation. He decided to endure the cross. The word endure is the word hupomone. He decided to bear up under the weight of the cross. The easiest thing for Jesus to do was to simply say he wasn't going to do it. But he saw what was going to happen on the other side. If he endured the cross, he and only he could provide the only way for all humanity, if they wanted it, to receive the forgiveness of sins once for all. And so he chose with great joy to bear up under the weight and the pressure of the cross for our sakes. And not only that, but he also knew and saw on the other side that the Holy Spirit, three days later, would raise him from the dead, and once again, he would be sitting at the right hand of the Father. If you're taking notes, write this down. Jesus remained under the pressure of the cross because he knew what it meant for us on the other side. Does that make sense, church? Good, because I can now take this thing off of me. It, I'm gonna to have to take a lot of Advil later on today. Now, the second word for patience in the New Testament is also a compound word in the Greek language. The word is makrothumeo. Say makrothumeo, ready? Makrothumeo. The word macro means long, and the word thumeo means hot or passion or anger. Write the word hot down. Uh, the, the word thumeo uh, shares the same root word where we get our word thermometer. Thumeo, thermometer. And the idea is that when you're in a trying or difficult situation that is testing your patience, that we stick this spiritual thermometer in your mouth and we look how long does it take you to get hot? How long does it take you to get heated up and bent out of shape? Does this make sense? So if you're writing notes, write this down. Uh, patience means, macrothumeo means take a long time to get hot or to get angry, or to get bent out of shape. Now, Roseanne and I have been married for 38 years, and by all good intents and purposes, it looks like we're going to make it to the end, married together. As a matter of fact, I will tell you that uh, Roseanne and I, and I just, I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you the truth, Roseanne and I have a great marriage. Ask her when I'm not around, see if she says the same thing. Uh, and I really do, and, and the reason is, is, it's not just a surviving marriage, it is a thriving marriage. And if you're gonna have a thriving marriage, at some point, you're gonna have to learn not to pick on each other. At some point, you're gonna have to learn not to nitpick on every possible thing. At some point, you're gonna have to realize whenever you see a weakness or a shortfall, you can't speak up every single, sometimes you have to speak up, but not every single time. At some point, you're gonna have to accept the whole package of the person you married. That whole package means that they have some strengths, but they also have corresponding weaknesses. You love and you celebrate the strengths, and then you compliment the weaknesses. You do not badger them. Does that make sense? And Roseanne and I have learned this in all but one area. And it's when we're driving. <laughs> and I don't know why we can't figure this out, uh, but I can tell you that Roseanne's driving tests my patience. For example, Roseanne always drives slow. Uh, and for me, slow means anything one mile or less under the maximum speed limit. Okay? I just don't understand why someone would not take full advantage of the maximum legal speed limit. It just does not make sense to me, right? I don't believe in speeding, but I believe you should take the maximum at all times on the road. The second thing is, is that Roseanne never changes lanes, never changes lanes, okay? And, and I'm, I'm sitting there in the car patiently. We're behind 17 semis. And the other lanes are completely open, and I finally have to say it. You know, sweetheart, <laughs> the other lanes are available, right? It just, it just irks me. Well, the same is also true, and I don't completely understand why. Um, here's what it is. Roseanne says that I'm always changing lanes. Okay, I don't know if that's completely true. Always, I mean, always. You women use like all, always, never, always. I don't know if I'm always changing lanes, but I change lanes a lot. And I'll tell you why. Because I work for the Lord. 
And the reason I changed lanes is because I'm trying to, as fast as I can to get to a place where I have the opportunity to expand the kingdom and help people who are hurting. And the faster I can get there, the faster I can get to another place. I don't do it for me, I do it for the people. And she doesn't seem to get that. The other thing she says is I never use my turn signal. Right? I mean, I'm not really, and to be honest with you, she may be right. I don't really know. And you know why I don't know? Because when I am driving, I am always constantly praying for the people of Westside Family Church. And sometimes, just sometimes, I may forget, okay? I mean, you get that. I can look on you, you get it, but she can't. And the other thing she says that I always do is that I always tailgate. Now, I have to tell you, tailgating is a matter of perspective. But if I tailgate, there's a good reason why I do it. I'm trying to help people along. (laughs) Help them along. Help me help you. Isn't it interesting within the human dynamic, we have a tendency of lacking patience with other people on the basis of what we are strong at or what we have preferences toward. And then in the same breath, we turn around and expect people to offer us patience, to offer us a a little bit of grace for our miscomings and our weaknesses. It is completely hypocritical, completely inconsistent. And I have learned in these later years of my life, if for no other reason you need to show patience to other people so that they might feel comfortable and passionate in showing patience back to you. This is what God has done for us, macro through macro. I want to introduce you to a passage in 2 Peter chapter 3 that I'm pretty sure many of you have not <clears throat> seen before or sat in. And so we're going to sit in this passage for just a little bit and really pull out what Peter's trying to say to us. In verse 1, he begins, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. What Peter's saying is that in the last days, and they have arrived, that scoffers are going to emerge who are basically going to challenge the existence of God based upon the integrity of God. They're saying, their argument, for centuries, your prophets and your messengers have told us that God is going to return and ultimately bring judgment on the earth for all the evil and the bad that has been done. And they laugh and say, we have been waiting for centuries Centuries have come and gone, and your God hasn't lifted his finger. It's all hogwash. So Peter goes on to say, but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. That's pretty intense for an Easter passage of Scripture. But it's really important. Peter's saying to these scoffers, there's two things you need to keep in mind. Number one, you have forgotten that God has brought universal judgment at one time in the past through the flood, the deluge, the story of a guy named Noah. The earth was destroyed by water. God judged the evil. And God then promised, if you know the story, he promised that he would never do that again. That's why we have the rainbow. He would never do that again. That is, he would never destroy the earth again by water. The second thing Peter says, you need to keep in mind, there is a second judgment coming where Christ is going to return and this time he's going to judge the earth, not by water, but this time by fire. This is what the Bible teaches. The resurrected Jesus is right now sitting at the right hand of the Father. And at just the right time, God the Father is going to send his son to the earth to judge the earth and all who are in it. And our earth is going to be consumed with fire 
and God is going to create out of that a new heaven and a new earth. And on that new earth, it will be a place for God to reside along with all of those who have embraced his forgiveness in this life to live with him on the new earth forever and ever. Can I get an amen? Peter goes on to say, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So Peter is responding to the scoffers who say that it appears that the delay of God in bringing judgment as he promised is a verification that he doesn't exist or isn't as powerful, so the scoffers say. And you have to admit that at first glance, it appears that they may be right. I mean, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus left this earth. He promised he would come back for us, and it's been 2,000 years. It could lead the average person to say, this is a hoax. Jesus isn't coming. Live however you want. Peter says, not so. Then he goes on in the next verses to give the reason for the apparent delay. Listen to this. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. And this is what I want you to see. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The reason for the apparent delay is because God is patient with us. The word is macro thumeo. God is patient with us. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Jesus is delaying his coming so as many people as possible has a chance to hear. That's why he's delaying. He is waiting for as many people as possible to respond to the free offer of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins and the gaining of eternal life. He's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting. But here's the deal. Once Jesus decides to come back, the deal is off. If you have not accepted at his return, there is no opportunity So he's waiting for you now. Aren't you glad he's waiting? We don't know exactly when he will return. Later in the book of 2 Peter, he calls this day the day of the Lord. And he says the day of the Lord is going to come upon us like a thief. A thief never calls you up and says, hey, I just want to give you a heads up. I'm breaking into your place at three today. Right? A thief comes unexpectedly, and so it will be with the coming of the Lord. It will take us all by surprise. However, there are some signs as to when the general season of the return of Christ may come. It's all throughout the Bible, but particularly in the lips of Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 24. I've been recently struck by verse, uh, uh, by verse 24 particularly. Listen to this, church. And this gospel, Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. From the heart of God's love, from the very depths of God's justice, he wants to make sure that every nation on the face of the earth has a chance to hear the invitation of Jesus, and that's why he waits. I'm working with an organization right now called Faith Comes by Hearing, and they are committed to producing translations of the Bible in all the languages in an audio format, and they are partnering together with uh, all the other translations organizations in the world. They're working together to complete a portion or all of scripture for all of the remaining nations who currently do not have the good news of God's word. 
And the reality is, I'm so excited about Faith Comes By Hearing because they're working on audio Bibles, and that is because the remaining nations who do not have the word of God are illiterate. That is, they cannot read. As a matter of fact, 73% of all the world cannot read, but that's okay because you don't have to know how to read to get the message. The book of Romans says faith comes by, by hearing. And so these really smart people, including people who can translate as well as business leaders all over the world, have come together and they have said, they have declared, we can finish the assignment of making sure every nation has had a chance to hear by the year 2033. Could it possibly be that that is the year that the Lord will return? Could it be 2034? We don't know. It's gonna come like a thief. The reality is, it could happen today. A few verses later, Peter restates his point. Look at this. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience, macrothemeo, our Lord's patience means salvation for more people. Because of the Lord's patience, many people have come to Christ. Because the Lord has not returned yet, that means that there is still time for you. There's still time for you. He loves you that much. And those of us that are in the United States of America, we are the ones without any excuse. And yet he loves you enough to hold back. He is waiting for you to bow your knee to Jesus and take him seriously. Over the course of our Believe series, we have invited people throughout it to sign their name to a door. And by signing a name to the door, they're, they're declaring, I believe. They be they're declaring, I'm all in. They're declaring, I thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. They're saying, I have asked Christ to apply his forgiveness to me. And we've had many people sign many doors over the course of these many weeks. As a matter of fact, even on Friday, uh, during the Friday, uh, Good Friday uh, experience here at Westside, many people walk through the stations of the cross. Over a thousand people did. And at the end of the experience, they were invited to sign a door. Again, saying, Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. I'm all in. I believe. I'm placing my name here to declare that I want to receive uh, your forgiveness and to receive eternal life. As a matter of fact, on Friday, my wife, Roseanne, and her friend, Amanda, who lead our deaf ministry here at the church, my wife is a fluent in sign language, hosted 15 deaf people here. And at the end of the journey, a new uh, man that came, they asked him as he signed the door, when did it first dawn on you that Jesus did this for you. And the man said, just tonight. And he signed the door and received forgiveness. There is not a name on any door that hasn't been covered by the blood of Christ. Not a single name. Not a single name that hasn't received the forgiveness of God when they asked for it. When you came in, in your program, you received a door. I want you to pull it out. Everybody needs to pull this door out right now. It looks like this. And I wanna give you a chance right now in this service to write your name on the door. And by writing your name on the door, you are basically saying, I believe. You're basically saying, I'm all in. You're basically saying, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. You're basically saying, I am asking God to apply the blood of Christ to my sins so that I can be forgiven. For some of you, you're writing your name down. This is merely an affirmation of something you've done before. It's an affirmation. But for some of you, it will be an initiation into a relationship with God. It's the first time it's really dawned on you and you're writing your name down. And if you're the first time you've done this, I just want you to whisper a prayer to God. It begins with saying to God, God, I confess that I am a sinner and that I'm in need of salvation. I'm in need of a savior. Number two, whisper to God, God, I believe I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died and rose again on the third day. And the last one's the most important. And God, I am asking, I am begging of you to forgive me of my sins and grant me 
eternal life through the work of your son on the cross. The work of his son on the cross. So if, if you're in, write your name down. And then what I want you to do is I want you to hold the card up like this, just like I'm doing. Just hold it up, and I want you to look at it, okay? Just hold the card up like this, okay? Now look at the card. I want to show you what Jesus Christ has done for you. The forgiveness has always been there, folks. God has just been patiently waiting for you to ask for it. If you didn't put your name on the card, if you're not there yet, you're questioning, you still have uh, uh, doubts, you're still holding out, that's okay. God is still, at this moment, patiently waiting for you. But I would not be truthful if I did not tell you that your time, in fact, is running out. We are in the last days, and one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to die, or Christ is going to return unexpectedly, and when that happens, the deal will be off. And I beg, I invite you, I beg that you would talk to one of us after the service. Let this be the day that you bow your knee to Jesus and see the words forgiven written across your name. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Um, In all of our services, people have committed to publicly confess their allegiance to Jesus Christ. There are gonna be people from all of our services and all of our campuses uh, out in the Connections area are gonna be doing that, the commons. But we've selected a couple to be baptized in the service and give them a chance to tell their story. Uh, The reason they're doing this is because uh, Jesus asked them to do it. He's saying, anybody who has received the forgiveness of sins into your life, into your heart, I'm asking you, for me, I'm asking you to go public and tell people you're not ashamed of me. I want you to be baptized. So that's why these people are doing it. And the idea is that when they're, when they're put in, down into the water, it symbolizes that their old life is over. Their old life is gone. They are dead to their sins. And when they come out of the water, it represents new life, a new beginning, a new journey. And it also represents the resurrection that they will one day receive as Christ received when he rose again from the dead. Now, the Bible tells us that whenever um, someone gets baptized, that the angels in heaven are surrounding the throne of God, and they don't understand the concept of redemption. They have not needed to be redeemed, so it just blows their mind that God takes somebody so far from him and redeems them. And it says whenever someone comes out of the water, (laughs) the angels in heaven around the throne of God just cheer, clap, and go crazy. So I'm going to invite you, when these folks come out of the water, that you join with the angels in celebrating what God has done today to redeem them. Amen. Father, we now come to you. We're so grateful that you have been patient with us. And Father, today on this Easter Sunday, we are so very, very grateful. And now, Father, we celebrate the lives of those who are going public for you today. We celebrate with them as the angels in heaven do as well. In the name of Jesus.